Hello everyone and welcome to our unit on um, psychological disorders and their treatments. Um, I'm going to go through these notes rather quickly. I'm not going to do a ton of lecturing on each page because I understand that you guys can read. So in order to keep this brief, I'm going to focus on the most important information on each slide and I encourage you to pause or go back and review the notes as you need to. So to define a psychological disorder, some behavior is disordered if it is persistently harmful. Right, so it has to be harmful enough to a person to be impacting their life, to be negatively impacting them or those around them in a pretty significant way. We think of disorders in a medical way now as illnesses, sicknesses that can be treated and we can help people overcome these sicknesses. Um, for a lot of our history, mental disorders or people with mental disorders were treated in a pretty bad and negative way and there's still a lot of stigma surrounding mental health, but um, I think this is changing for the better. It's important always to consider the duration and severity of symptoms when diagnosing disorders. They have to last for a certain amount of time and they have to be severe enough um, to warrant a diagnosis. For example, there's a difference between being worried and having anxiety. Anxiety is worry to a high enough level that, is, that it is significantly negatively impacting a person's life functioning. The number one rule when discussing mental health is no self-diagnosis. I want you to write this on something and stick it on your wall or on your computer somewhere where you can see it all the time while you're, while you're studying mental illnesses because it is super easy to fall into this trap. You are not a doctor and neither am I. We cannot diagnose ourselves or each other with mental disorders. No self-diagnosis. Um, I want you to think about some of the pros and cons of labeling people and of the names of mental disorders and what some of the benefits or harms might be of that. This is an activity you're going to do. Um, so you can feel free to pause the video here and do some thinking about that and then come back to the video when you're done. So there are multiple perspectives on understanding mental health. Um, there are some biological influences that play a role, like genetic differences in brain chemistry. There are plenty of psychological influences, like stress and trauma. And there are some sociocultural influences as well, such as the definition of normality. For example, um, throughout much of the history of treating mental health as or, uh, psychological, psychological disorders as mental illnesses, um, people would consider women having strong emotions to be hysteria, a type of mental disorder that no longer gets classified as such, but for over a hundred years, women having feelings was considered a mental disorder. So the definition of what's normal can change and that can change whether something is labeled as a disorder or not. There are many risk and protective factors that can either increase or decrease a person's chance of developing some mental illness during their lifetime. Um, I'm going to let you feel free to read these yourself. Uh, but I want you to note all of these are correlative, not causative. So we don't have a ton of cause and effect experiments in mental health for obvious ethical reasons. So these are all correlational factors that have found to either predict an increase or decrease chance. Um, and here's the rest of that chart as well, but I'm not going to go into detail on this one. You can read it. Okay, so the APA has created this book. It's an encyclopedia. I have a copy sitting on my shelf in my classroom being useless because we're all locked out of the school. Um, but I have uploaded a PDF copy of it to Google Classroom for you. I suggest you download that in order to get it to load faster so you can read through it. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is the book that's used to describe all the psychological disorders. It's like an encyclopedia or a reference book. The most recent version, the DSM-5, was updated in 2013. There were many, many changes made between this version and the last edition, the DSM-4, which was published in the 70s and revised in 2000. So a lot of things changed for the new DSM, um, most of them for the better, including a lot of reclassifying and renaming of disorders. So I'll mention some of those changes as it becomes relevant. Um, but this is the book that helps psychiatrists and psychologists diagnose mental illnesses. The DSM-5 has three basic sections. The first section is basically an introduction. Here's what we changed. Section two is the bulk of the book. It's all of the disorders and the criteria that are used to diagnose them uh, in different categories. And then section three has different ways that, doc that doctors can measure symptoms. And it also proposes things that might need to improve in further editions of the book. So um, this first section is going to have 
a whole bunch of what I call the smaller categories. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of mental disorders. We are not going to have time to cover every single one. So I've broken them into categories and I'm kind of hitting the most common or most prevalent disorders in, the ca in these categories, but there are many, many more. So just because something doesn't appear in this video, it doesn't mean it's not a mental disorder. It just means it's not one that's common and typically in the curriculum for this course. We're going to start with the anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders are all centered around having feelings of excessive apprehension or anxiety. We're going to cover generalized anxiety disorder, phobias, and panic disorder in this section. Generalized anxiety is what it sounds like, having a lot of worry about a bunch of different stuff. Some anxiety disorders are specific, like phobias, there's a specific thing you're afraid of. But with generalized anxiety, sometimes just labeled as anxiety, it's chronic worry about lots of different things. So it's not really narrowed down. And this has to occur more often than not for six months to get a diagnosis. And it has to cause significant impairment um, in the person's life. It has to include at least three of the following symptoms in addition to that chronic worry. Restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, or sleep disturbance. Now at this point, you're probably breaking the rule, right? Do you remember the rule? No self-diagnosis, right? It's really easy to look at this and go, yeah, wow, I'm restless. I can't fall asleep. I'm having trouble concentrating. I'm grumpy. Guess what? We're all living through a global, global pandemic. Of course you're having trouble sleeping and you're irritable and you can't concentrate. That doesn't mean you all have generalized anxiety disorder, okay? Don't break the rule. No self-diagnosis. Phobias um, are persistent and irrational strong fears of specific objects or situations. There's a difference between fears and phobias. Lots of people are afraid of stuff. But if it's not causing a really strong negative impact on your life, it's not a phobia. Um, for example, plenty of people are afraid of clowns. But a phobia of clowns, I had a coworker who had a phobia of clowns when I was in college. He would, we worked in a costume shop and he would have to leave the building and go out into the back alley when someone entered the shop in a clown outfit on Halloween because he could not handle even being in the same building as that person. And as you can imagine, working in a real retail setting, that's going to have a pretty significant negative impact on his ability to do his job. That's the difference between a phobia and a fear of like, okay, I'm not going to watch the newest It movie, right? Um, specific phobia means there's some specific object or situation you're afraid of, and it can be basically anything. Um, the old names for phobias come from Greek, like arachnophobia, fear of spiders, or hemophobia, fear of blood. But we don't use those names anymore. It's just called specific phobia now. Um, there are also, the only one that we still keep the name for, the Greek name for, is agoraphobia. Um, and agora was an ancient Greek market, which was this wide open market where crowds would come and like buy and sell things. Um, so that's what an agora is, and that's where the name of this comes from. But it's not the fear of being in wide open spaces specifically. It's the fear of being in a situation that it's difficult to escape from. Um, you have to have fear in at least two of the five situations listed here. But notice they're not all wide open spaces. Some of them are crowded places or places that you get stuck, like a bus. So that's agoraphobia. That has a separate name because it's commonly comorbid with other disorders. Comorbid means it occurs at the same time as something else. Um, social anxiety disorder, otherwise known as social phobia, is also gets sort of a separate name. Social anxiety is a fear of social situations in which you're going to be potentially scrutinized or negatively evaluated. Social anxiety is about excessively being afraid of someone else thinking bad or negative things about you or being critical of you, and it causes you to have significant impairment in your ability to interact with other people on a day-to-day -day basis. That has a separate name also. Okay, number three on the anxiety disorder list is panic disorders. Now a panic attack is a discrete period of intense fear with a whole bunch of physical symptoms that go along with it. Panic disorder is when you have recurrent panic attacks that you can't control. So anyone can have a panic attack. It's a pretty common stress symptom. You can have a panic attack or two in your life and not have panic disorder. Panic disorder is when you're having them all the time. So panic attacks are a symptom. Panic disorder is the illness. So make sure you understand the difference there. Um, all right, that is it for the anxiety disorders. Next, neurodevelopmental disorders. These are disorders that impact learning, language, motor, or social skills in kids. 
So neuro meaning related to your neurological system, your brain and your nervous system, and developmental meaning related to your development. So these are disorders that are diagnosed in childhood or adolescence. Most of them are diagnosed in really young children. Sometimes they don't get caught until someone is a teenager, but um, these are not something you would get diagnosed with in your like 40s. This is things that affect children. Um, the four main types that we're going to focus on today are attention deficit disorder, the autism spectrum, Tourette's disorder, and then some other ones that are included in this category is intellectual and developmental disabilities, like having a strong intellectual disability, communication disorders, learning disorders like dyslexia, and other motor disorders that impact a person's movement. Um, I have some video clips that you can watch that go along with each of these, the main three that we're going to cover, ADD, autism, and Tourette's disorder. Um, I encourage you to watch these videos because they elaborate more on the specific diagnostic criteria for each, um, each of the neuro neurodevelopmental disorders, and they give you some examples of what life might be like for a person who has that disorder. So I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on these because I need you to watch those other video clips. But ADD is basically about an inability to control your focus or your attention. It's called attention deficit, meaning what's missing, what's impaired in a person with ADD is the ability to control what their brain is thinking about, what they're focusing on. So it's like uh, you're kind of unable to separate the static from the important information and you're paying attention to everything equally. Autism spectrum Autism is pretty strongly misunderstood. I think autism is called a spectrum because every single symptom of autism has a spectrum of whether you can have that symptom at all and to what degree. So every person who has autism experiences it differently. Um, there is no difference anymore between Asperger's and the autism spectrum. Autism used to have like five different names under the autism umbrella and they're just all called autism spectrum now. But it's really important that you don't assume that every person with autism experiences it the same way. In general, the impairments in the autism spectrum surround social interactions, communication, um, and restricted or repetitive behaviors and interests. So this can range all the way from um, having difficulty interpreting facial expressions all the way to being completely nonverbal and unable to talk. So it's a pretty diverse array of symptoms for autism. I encourage you to watch this video that I've linked here. Um, Tourette's disorder is a tick disorder where if you've ever had a muscle spasm, like your eye twitches or there's a, like a thigh muscle that twitches and you can't control it, Tourette's is like a muscle spasm but in your brain. Um, so you have multiple physical tics that you just kind of can't control and at least one phonic tic, one noise that you make. So people assume Tourette's is about shouting curse words. That's not accurate. Most of the tics in Tourette's are actually movements and there's one phonic tic most of the time. The phonic tic is actually little noises and not language at all. So please watch those video clips for more information on those disorders. Next, obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. These are disorders characterized by obsessive thoughts and repetitive or compulsive behaviors. We're going to focus on OCD here. But related to this, in this same category, are body dysmorphia, hoarding, and other fo body-focused disorders like pulling hair and picking skin. Now, I don't want you to read that and freak out like, oh, I'm a skin, I pick my scabs once in a while, I have excoriation disorder excoriation disorder and trichotillomania are much more severe than casually picking at a scab. But we're going to focus on OCD here. So obsessions are recurrent thoughts that you can't control that are intrusive. And compulsions are behaviors that a person will take to try to reduce the anxiety from the obsessions. So OCD used to be grouped under the anxiety disorders for that reason, and now it has its own category. But basically, the obsessions are not just worries. They're excessive, intrusive, repetitive thoughts that just dominate your brain and you can't think about anything else. And the person also feels that they must perform the compulsions. They're not optional, they're mandatory. And typically, they're sometimes they're called rituals. They're pretty rigid um, rules or specific actions a person has to take to try to reduce the anxiety from the obsessions. And focusing on obsessions and engaging in compulsive behaviors has to take up at least an hour of your day and impact your normal functioning in order to qualify as having OCD. So a person is not OCD because they like their binder to be organized. It drives me a little crazy that people use that phrase, OCD, to describe normal desires to be organized. That's not what obsessive compulsive disorder is. It's a pretty severe disorder and has a pretty strong negative impact on a person's life. And I don't like that people trivialize it in that way. So some of the more common obsessions 
and compulsions have to do with dirt, germs, toxins, and washing. Um, so sometimes people will wash their hands 30 times in a row because every time they touch the faucet, they feel dirty again and they have to wash again. And they'll come back to their job with their hands all red and raw and scarred up from washing them so much. Um, it can also be obsessions having to do with something bad happening or sometimes with symmetry and order, but that is a very comparatively uncommon obsession compared to some of these other ones on the chart. Um, this is a PET scan of the brain of a person with OCD. You can see high activity in the areas involved with focus and attention. So you can see on the PET scan why, like the evidence that this person is sort of overactively focused on some particular thought. We're going to go quickly through some of the explanations of where some of these anxieties can come from. Uh, Freud says that anxiety comes from repression of painful impulses or thoughts from the id, right? From a learning or uh, behavior modification perspective, we explain that anxiety comes from classical and operant conditioning, from something really scary happening while you're in the presence of a stimulus, and then you associate that fear with that stimulus. If I almost fall off a cliff while I'm in the presence of a clown, then I'm going to associate the fear of almost dying with seeing the clown, and now I will have a conditioned phobia of clowns. Um, many phobias often happen that way, something scary or traumatic happening, and then you're associating the fear with whatever stimulus was nearby. Sometimes it can come from watching others. You learn to be afraid of things by watching others be afraid of things. Um, kids can learn to be afraid of stuff by watching their parents, for example. Biologically, some fears and phobias we have are naturally selected. We've talked about that before. There is some genetic connection to anxiety disorders. Twins, for example, are more likely to share phobias. Um, and neurologically, there is a specific part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. It's part of the brain that associates um, emotional responses to pain. Um, generalized anxiety, panic attacks, and OCD are all linked with excessive activity in this part of the brain. Okay, next category, trauma and stressor-related disorders. These are disorders related to exposure to trauma or a stressful event. Obviously, we're considering post-traumatic stress disorder here, but there are other stress-related disorders in this category as well. But post-traumatic stress, or PTSD, is a traumatized reaction to either actual or threatened death, injury, or, se or sexual violence. So you're not going to get PTSD from watching a movie. Um, this is something that a person has to actually experience. There's also something called chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, which is when... Um, like children who are victims of child abuse will often develop this, where they have a long experience of smaller traumas and stressors, but it's throughout their whole childhood. So there are multiple variants of PTSD, but in general, the, the event has to be real. It has to have happened in your real life. It can't be something um, that you've watched on a screen or listened to. It comes with avoiding stimuli associated with the event, a bunch of negative changes in mood and in cognition, like problems with memory, negative beliefs about yourself, blaming yourself for the event, a general negative emotional state, and social withdrawal. That's what makes PTSD hard to treat, is that people who suffer from it tend to isolate themselves. Um, it also comes with um, excessive arousability, irritability, recklessness, um, concentration problems, sleep problems, and hypervigilance. In addition to all that stuff, PTSD also comes with at least a month or more of at least one of these symptoms, haunting memories, nightmares, flashbacks, or intense strong reactions to similar stimuli. There are stories, every 4th of July I read stories all over the internet of former soldiers with PTSD having to hide when fireworks go off because the fireworks are a stimulus similar enough to explosions come, that come from battle um, that it activates these excessive intense reactions. Um, so post-traumatic stress disorder is pretty serious. Uh, but it is treatable. And so, you know, if you feel like you have someone who's suffering from this, try to reach out to them, try to help them out, right? Let them know you support them. Um, and it's not that every person who experiences violence or trauma ends up with PTSD. Some do and some don't, and it's not really clear why. Next category, dissociative disorders. These are disorders, now dissociation is kind of hard to explain, but Basically, it means a separation or a discontinuity or disruption of your sense of identity or self. Feeling separated from your own body or separated from reality or separated from your memory. This is frequently, like the stress-related disorders, found in the aftermath of trauma. Um, 
So we've got four disorders here, depersonalization, derealization, dissociative amnesia, and dissociative identity disorder. We're going to start with depersonalization and derealization. Depersonalization is feeling separated from your own sense of self. Like you're, you know, watching your body move around and do things, but you have no connection to it. A derealization disorder is like a detachment from reality, from your surroundings. Feeling like you're in a dream, that nothing is actually real, Every all the world around you seems really foggy and distorted and sort of unnatural. These are their disorders in their own right. They're also common symptoms of other disorders like panic attacks. Um, so sometimes a person can experience derealization or depersonalization and not have that disorder on its own. Dissociative amnesia is amnesia that comes from trauma. So you experience some kind of traumatic event and then you can't remember it. You sort of wipe your own memory, right? Like you can't remember the events you've experienced because you're sort of shutting down. Um, this can also come with something called dissociative fugue, which means you're showing purposeful travel. You just leave. You wake up one day. You don't remember anything about who you are or where you're from. You feel this strong desire to just travel sometimes with some purpose in mind like I need to move to Boise Idaho or sometimes it's just aimless wandering um, and this is typically a trauma reaction. And last we have dissociative identity disorder this is uh, formerly known as multiple personality disorder but basically what happens is the person's identity or sense of self dissociates or splits into two or more distinct and alternating personalities along with recurrent gaps in memory of everyday events potentially because one of the alter, alternate identities has sort of been in control and the main identity doesn't remember anything that's happened then. This is a picture of a lady named Chris Sizemore who um, has dissociative identity disorder and her story was the basis of the film Three Faces of Eve, which I've showed in class before and now I can't remember if I showed it to you guys or not. But if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. It's an excellent film. There are some controversies surrounding dissociative identity disorder, mainly because it's very commonly portrayed in movies and TV shows. And the diagnosis has increased in the last sort of 50 years. You don't find it as much in other countries. And there's some psychologists who think that people who have it are role-playing um, or learning that if I just, you know, be this other person, then I don't have the anxiety that my regular self has. Um, however, um, the response to this is it's a legitimate disorder. It's in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. There's plenty of people that have it and suffer greatly from having this constant change in their personality. So I don't really, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm not a professional psychiatrist. I couldn't tell you, but I just wanted you to know there are some criticisms against the legitimacy of this disorder. And I encourage you to look it up and do some reading and watching on YouTube about it. It's really fascinating. So this question, I'll ask you to pause it here so that you can read the question and answer it for yourself. Which of the following is false? Go ahead and pause. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you the answer. The false one is D. Dissociative identity disorder is not the same as schizophrenia. Movies will portray a person with multiple personalities and then say, or have the characters say, that person is schizophrenic. That is completely false. Schizophrenia is a totally different disorder. It has nothing to do with DID. Um, they're not related to each other at all. They have almost no symptoms in common. So schizophrenia is totally different. That's a false one. Next category, the feeding and eating disorders. These are basically we're going to talk about anorexia and bulimia, but there are other disorders in this category like binge eating too. And basically they all have to do with disturbance of eating behavior that impacts your uh, physical health or your social functioning. We're going to start with anorexia nervosa. This is basically starving oneself, strongly restricting energy intake, which results in very low body weight. You have, I've seen horrible pictures of people weighing like 80 pounds and basically being a skeleton with skin wrapped around it. It's scary. Um, but the person has an intense fear of gaining weight and a disturbance in their own perception of their shape and weight. So a person with anorexia might be deadly thin and still perceive themselves as fat and they have an intense fear of gaining that weight which causes them to restrict their eating. Bulimia nervosa has recurrent episodes of binge eating and then purging to prevent weight gain, such as self-induced vomiting or misusing laxatives, um, fasting, or exercising for hours at a day, uh, hours at a time to try to negate the impact of the binge eating on weight. Um, bulimia, these behaviors have to occur at least once a week for three months. 
Um, people with bulimia nervosa also consider their body shape and weight as overly important to their own evaluation of their self-worth. So um, people with this disorder will believe that all of their self-worth comes from how they look and how much they weigh, and they don't appropriately consider other factors like personality and education and intelligence in that evaluation. Next category, the somatic symptom disorders. These are really interesting. These are disorders that are basically your mind causing your body to have symptoms that don't actually exist. Physical symptoms without physical causes. Physical symptoms that come from psychological disturbances. There are three disorders here, somatic symptom disorder, conversion disorder, and illness anxiety disorder, which was formerly known as hypochondria. So somatic symptom disorder is physical symptoms like nausea or pain. Conversion disorder is neurological symptoms like numbness or blindness or paralysis or seizures. A person can literally be blind because of a psychological problem. And their eyes work fine, their optic nerves work fine, their occipital lobe is perfectly well functioning, but they're converting a psychological trauma or problem into a neurological symptom like blindness. And the last one, illness anxiety disorder, is excessive worry about having a serious illness, going to the doctor all the time and getting tests one doesn't need, because there either are no symptoms at all, or the symptoms are very mild. Like I have one cough and I'm convinced I have lung cancer and I go spend a whole bunch of my money getting an MRI of my lungs to prove nothing because the person also wouldn't necessarily believe that the tests are true and would continue to pursue that and whatever because they have an excessive worry about having serious illnesses. That is it for part one of the mental disorders. Next video is part two where we will cover the remainder of them.